Greetings. The interviews you are about to see are the result of community leaders, elected officials, and law students coming together to seek a solution to problems here in Chicago. Of course, these problems are not confined to the city. These problems are of national relevance. For each problem, there would be a proactive and a reactive solution. A proactive solution seeks to address the root of a problem. This solution asks the key question of what causes this problem to occur. Whereas a reactive solution seeks to address the problem after the problem has already occurred. This type of solution seeks to protect others from those who have already chosen a path of criminal behavior. We hope you enjoy this documentary and thank you so much for your time. So if Chicago is considered to be one of the most segregated cities in America, what is it that can be done to address that issue? And maybe the fix isn't necessarily legislative, maybe it's a social fix some, somewhere in the community. Do you have any ideas about what can be done to address that issue? Yeah, not really. You know, um, Chicago, I'm 29, I'm one of the youngest representatives here in Chicago. Uh, in my lifetime, it's always been this way, I think to kind of move that pendulum we have to start with, with newer generations, and we need to do, just do more with encouraging interaction between schools. And we do it, you know, uh, with sports and different scholastic activities. But we need to, to take it a, a step further with bringing folks that aren't from particular communities into other communities uh, through field trips, just more creative ways to introduce different cultures. Because a lot of times, Chicago folks will just kind of stay within their box. And in and, and 2014, I shouldn't be saying that. But that's the case, uh, and I just think it's gonna, it's a seismic change, but it's gonna have to take place kind of one step at a time. So it seems like there is a policy aspect to the way in which Chicago's diversity, or the way in which Chicago's segregation plays out in, with respect to politics. You mentioned previously about their, uh, about the train and transportation system perhaps being a cause of the segregation issues. But I wonder if it's not also a, part of the reason why it still exists. So perhaps if there were tr transportation lines that could get people in and out of their community to, to get jobs in other parts of the city, then they could create an economic base to make their own communities uh, better. Is there some sort of policy effect outside of perhaps uh, train lines that could be used to effectuate the transport of people from the more impoverished areas to places where they can get good, decent jobs? Yeah, improving mass transit. So we have a committee in Springfield uh, and they have a committee in the city council level where they deal with transportation. And on mass transit, we're working to improve it. I think Chicago, kind of how it was laid out, is not the most optim optimal city for transportation. I'll give you a prime example. I think D.C. is easier city to get around to. The train system going every direction, uh, more props. Chicago, uh, the infrastructure was just not built that way. We had a lot of industry. So there's various reasons why, even in the way the Dan Ryan project had goes through the city of Chicago, is a little peculiar. We have one metro electric line uh, that goes uh, north and south. So um, improving mass transit is critical. Folks need to get from one place to another. Um, and you want to get all different types of folks to feel comfortable. And, and transit is important, and I'm um, a part of you know, helping to improve that here in Chicago and Illinois. Do you think it's fair to say that Chicago is one of the most segregated large cities in America? I think so. I think that's fair. Um, and do you, what do you think the cause of that is? Um, I think it's uh, concentrated investment, right? You know, um, sort of what I spoke of earlier. Uh, if if, if um, there's tolerance with regards to crime and um, tolerance with regards to underinvestment in, in uh, education and underinvestment in uh, commercial strips and, and bringing um, business to uh, certain areas. And then on the other hand, in other areas there's you know, arguably an overinvestment. <laughs> um, you're going to have that disparity, and part of that disparity is going to be reflected in in uh, in a racial segregation as well. Well, what segregation does is is it creates ignorance, um, and so it, oftentimes it it can be um, oftentimes prejudice could be non-malicious 
prejudice. It's just <coughs> prejudice out of ignorance. Um, so in the example I gave earlier about financial professionals, of just, oh, we don't know that they're, at, they're out there. We don't know that there's anybody competent. One of the replies we got early on is, well, we have a fiduciary duty. The implication of that is if you embrace uh, an MBE firm, you're doing something that is counter to your fiduciary duty, um, which means that, you know, because you're African American or Latino or, or uh, woman-owned, you're somehow less competent, um, whereby you were competent when you were an employee, when you were an investor in a majority firm. Um, um, so there's, uh, there's a sort of a blind ignorance. Now, there's intentional prejudice as well that uh, contributes to this, but th there's a lot of ignorance that is a byproduct of segregation. And so I think when it comes to segregation, a large part, of course, is the financial means. And, you know, you have this situation where when you do have people, you know, who do get the chance and the opportunity to leave, you know, a lower income, black area, maybe on the west side or the south side of Chicago, they go get educated, they may come back to Chicago, they're likely not going to live where they grew up. They're likely going to go somewhere else where they feel there's more opportunity for themselves and their family. So we don't have enough, I think, of people getting out of, you know, that area and then coming back and, and uplifting the community. With respect to the segregation in the city of Chicago, do you, is there, from your perspective as a community member, a fix that needs to be, uh, that needs to be worked on, perhaps not even at the political level, but more in, in the grass grassroots sort of uh, exercises? Yes, I think that, you know, a lot of times people perceive lower income um, residents to have, you know, a sense of apathy or a lack of wanting to be involved. And therefore, because I think the perception is that, that there are many people, for example, congressmen or maybe aldermen, they don't focus, they don't zone in on that area. You know, they may, that may be in their jurisdiction, but they may not focus in because it's kind of like, well, they don't care anyway, they don't vote. You know, the polls show that they don't come out to vote. And therefore, I think that that voice is not necessarily being heard. There are two types of solutions when it comes to any problem, the proactive and the reactive stances. The proactive solution seeks to fix the root of the problem. It looks at what exactly is causing a problem and, in essence, tries to nip it in the bud, whereas a reactive solution would look at what can we do now. How, do, how does a shooter uh, become a shooter? And I think it, again, relates back to underinvestment in, in, in the communities that many of these shooters come out of. Um, unless one believes in some sort of Darwinian um, theory that, you know, people of certain backgrounds are more prone to violence than people of other backgrounds, uh, then if you don't believe that, uh, then you, you have to go to examining the uh, economic disadvantage of, of the communities that much of this gun violence and other violence is taking place in. I, you know, as I negotiated our, our, our state's concealed carry policy, uh, sitting on the opposite side of some um, gun advocates, um, I made sure that I negotiated into our state policy that we would have uh, the sort of universal background checks that the, the, that the, the fed, feds are sh still short of achieving. So we now have background checks on par private sales of guns and we have mandatory reporting of loss and stolen weapons. And so the types of things that makes it easier for law enforcement to track the flow of guns into the hands of people that ought not have them, the uh, felons and the people that we know may do harm with it, people with mental health challenges and, 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 and so forth. So we still have to work on that policy, but separate and apart from that um, is the mentality and the, 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 the economic um, 
circumstances, uh, the lack of investment in, in uh, neighborhood schools and, and things of that nature that lead to, uh, and programs that lead to a point where gangs are competing for the attention of our youth more aggressively than positive programs are uh, 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 competing for that attention. And so they're capturing that and they're putting guns in uh, young people's hands at the age of uh, 14, 13 years old. Um, where their their minds aren't fully developed, developed, and they don't they 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 don't have fully have the capacity to have a full appreciation for what they do when they pull the trigger. I think it goes back to the what about us, the abandonment um, tone in in the in some of these communities. I think a lot of underprivileged and lower income residents in Chicago particularly they happen to live on the west side or on the south side where g gangs are very prevalent I think they have um, a reckless disregard for human life because they have a reckless disregard for their own they don't see themselves as being a valuable member of a community a valuable member a valuable citizen a valuable resident they just feel like so what it's just another person I'm just another person we don't contribute anything to the society and um, I think that because there's that morale you know, drop and there's that lack of purpose that they feel like, well, you know, we have to validate ourselves somehow and a gun does that for them. So I think that is um, definitely an issue in the African-American community, particularly um, lower income community. And I think that a lot of what is needed are these programs, like I'm saying, like the Urban League programs and the after school programs and the mentoring programs. I think we need more than the mentors that we have now. Every single child, I think, every single student that is growing up, period, needs a mentor. You know, it doesn't matter where they live, but focus on lower income, underprivileged communities. I think that every single student in, a, um, in an area or in a community that is labeled as lower income, they should have a mentor. They should have someone, um, almost like a sponsor, kind of like if, you know, you have people in AA, they have a sponsor. They should have someone when they're going to make a ridiculous decision that they can call, or they should have someone. And we need more pipeline programs. That's just the end of it. We need more resources to have those programs, and we need more mentors to be in those programs to provide a support system for our youth. We've got to claim our youth back, because right now we don't have control on our youth, and they're living out on the street as opposed to living in their house. They're getting... Um, their education is from their fellow gang members, and it's not from their teachers. You know, we got to claim back our we got to claim back our our youth. Yeah, I believe that we have to address this access to guns. We have too many guns. We have more guns in the United States than we have people. It's a problem. So, At fifty five is a great expressway, but that expressway has been the pipeline for thousands, hundreds of thousands of guns that have come from Mississippi, Arizona. Missouri that's ended up on the streets of the south and west side of Chicago where people like me live. Uh, how do we stop gun violence? Um, by reaching those individual children. Redirecting the life of a, a five-year-old right now who's going to be a, a 20-year-old, uh, you know, yielding a gun illegally. How do we take him from on being on the path to being a, uh, a, a gun felon to being a uh, high school and college graduate? Tell you a funny story. I had a uh, gentleman I met in Springfield, and he took me to his home, and it was a room about the size of the room we are now, full of guns. Oh. And he and I said, uh, "How many guns do you have?" He said, "Mark, I don't know how many guns I have." So he could have potentially have lost guns that could have ended up on our street. So tracking guns, it's a funny thing because uh, there's some privacy issues with tracking guns. I mean, do we really want to track them? So trying to figure out a creative way to keep those legal guns legal and not end up being illegal guns because it's not as though um, you know, guns are just coming out of the factory being illegal. The majority of them start off as legal guns or they're stolen from a legal gun owner and then they end up on our streets and they're used uh, to devastate someone's lives. So for a proactive solution, the key question is, what is the cause of crime and gun violence? With the solutions that were brought up earlier in this footage, we've seen three proactive measures brought forward, economic development, education, and mentorship programs. Whereas the reactive solution has a key question of 
How do we protect others from those who have already chosen the path of a criminal? How do we aid law enforcement? And these measures include creating a national registry and enforcement of a gun offender registry here in the city of Chicago. We got a just a, an array of issues, and I think that it's frustrating because we would like to solve them all, but that's just not the case. I, I would like to lean on going to the root of some of these issues, getting back to education and uh, mass transit are two large ones. Let's work on those, then we can kind of work on some of the other areas, and work on those other areas as well. But I want to focus as a state legislator education funding, getting more educational resources and opportunities for our children, after school programs, summer jobs, have those things to be uh, just kind of set in stone, line items that we have and resources for children to build that foundation. So when we send that 18 year old from high school, it's a productive adult, we send that 23, 22 year old who's graduating college, a productive adult, um, they'll fix all of these problems. So it seems to me that the the, the, ed, the education is simply the solution to all of these problems with respect to getting the economic situation to a level where families can sustain themselves without all of these outside pressures. Do you think that if the education system was implemented in a stronger manner here in uh, Chicago that all of these statistics about the splintering of the black family would sort of resolve themselves? And yet, no, and not just education alone. But that's an important piece. I mean, all these other things, you know, how we respect uh, one another just as African Americans, how we work together. I mean, there's an array of things that we can work on. But I would say education is just a key foundation piece because you don't have the low-skilled, high-paying jobs anymore. What do you need to sustain yourself? Probably just for just to survive in a city like Chicago. I think average salary in Illinois is uh, somewhere around thirty thousand, but in Chicago it's, it's somewhere up to forty-five thousand. You need forty-five thousand, fifty thousand dollars as at one individual to just have a reasonably comfortable life. I think we, it was an article I read. I can't say it specifically. Uh, somewhere around seventy to seventy-five thousand was a number that people picked just for folks that are generally happy. Anything above that, the job has too much stress. But you know, this, these are the numbers that you need. You're not going to get that working at McDonald's. You know, you're not going to get that working at Walmart. These are great transitional jobs, but you need uh, high head of household jobs. And education is kind of the only way to get there, or a specific uh, in-demand skill. So we got to get more African Americans to, to do on that. The number of African Americans, um, you know, with college degrees like, like you, that are working on their um, a you know, law degree uh, is, is, a, is a small percentage in our community, smaller than, than pr pretty much any other uh, demographic. That's a problem. The, the chief role of education in Chicago rests with not the government of Chicago or even the governor, government of Illinois, but with the parents in Chicago and demanding more for their, for their kids. There seem to have been in the last uh, two years or so here in Chicago a greater role of parents in involving themselves in the, situ in the education situation in response to the plan to, to close schools, mostly in brown neighborhoods. Yeah, so, so um, I like activism. I think it's healthy and, and it's great, but the activism should have, should have uh, started long before school closings. You know, there's some schools that indeed needed to be closed. The problem with the policy and the way that the Board of Education has appro approached it, they, they in one swoop um, tried to go too broad with it and, and, and perhaps um, close some schools without um, engaging the community and, and, and wrongfully so. Um, but the tolerance we've had in part, we, we need, instead of, we have a tendency to point outwards, um, instead of pointing outwards all the time, we need to point inwards, and uh, I'm a big advocate of the community schools concept. The community school concept invites the community into the school, and community organizations, parents, and that's the traditional school that s succeeds, is one that has the old, the entire community be supportive of the schools. So long before school closings, uh, there should have been activism. Um, and certainly, again, in the communities that have good schools, they demand good schools, and they have been demanding good schools. Um, 
and they've invested as a community in, the, in those schools and they have the wealth to do it. Um, but notwithstanding not necessarily having all that wealth, there's still uh, the notion that we ought to uh, demand high standards. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of Haitian immigrants and, uh, and you know, it's, it's the most economically disadvantaged country in the Western Hemisphere, but you know, folks, I've, I've traveled to Haiti where folks uh, make sure their kids, folks in poverty, make sure their kids are dressed up in their uniforms and are getting to school on time. I remember going to my dad's hometown and seeing a guy on a moped with four children hanging on to him in their school uniforms, taking them, uh, taking them to school. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a desire to have, to want better for your kid. And if you want better for your kid, you want your kid to be held to a high standard. Let's start talking about school closing. The school, school closing program here in Chicago has been very controversial to say the least. But are there any good benefits of the uh, school closing program? Again, while many people are kind of upset about the school closings, and rightfully so, I think it does um, provide an opportunity for students to go to other schools and hopefully get, you know, a sound education and, and a little bit more resources than they may have been getting at their school if it was under-enrolled. It is a fact that many of the closed schools were in predominantly African-American areas. And I think that um, when it comes to the African-American community, they have a, there's always a sense of loyalty, whether it's you know high income, middle income, lower income, there's always a sense of loyalty to that community. And I think that it, I think it did a little bit of disservice to the spirit. I think it affected the morality of those in the areas where the schools were closed because it kind of felt like, well, here we go again. Nobody cares about us. And so we have to rebuild that morality and rebuild that sense of spirit in those communities, I think. So I do think that, unfortunately, it will uh, detrimentally affect the African-American communities because, again, that's where the uh, highest number of the schools were closed. Mm -hmm.